back in late November of last year when I was preparing worship themes for January and February, I noted in the worship preparation paragraph for this particular Sunday and this particular scripture that we take our bodies for granted until something breaks down. A bad back spreads misery throughout the body. But how much respect and appreciation did we have for our back before it started spasming? Our physical bodies remind us that in the realm of community, of relationships, all the parts of the body matter. The health of the whole is also vitally important. And the parts we take for granted or fail to care for are often actually indispensable. Thanks be to God for the whole body and for every different part. Talking about a bad back in that preparation paragraph and how it's suffering or spasming affects the whole body might sound like one random example of how each part of the body is important and how every part is connected to and affects every other part. It might sound like a random example, except at the time that I was writing that paragraph in my worship planning materials, for me, it wasn't a random example, but a very real example. When I wrote those notes, I had just come off a long couple of months of back problems. Regular visits to the chiropractor, getting up some mornings and just not being able to stand up straight, heating pads and stretching regimens, and at my lowest moment, getting up from the table after eating breakfast one morning and having my back clutch in sudden muscle spasm and discovering that all I could do was lay down on the floor and wait for the stabbing feeling to stop. My stupid back was what I found myself saying. Why was my lower back such a problem? Everything else seemed fine. My feet didn't hurt, my neck didn't hurt, my arms and legs worked okay. I could think with my brain and type with my fingers and see with my eyes, but my back, it wouldn't let me stand up straight. It hurt after I sat for a while and finally it put me on the floor. My stupid back. Except of course it wasn't my back's fault. In fact, my back isn't something that is separate from me. My back is part of me. Or I might even say that my back is me, just like every other part of me is me. If my back is hurting, it means that my body is hurting. And maybe it even means that while my back is the part of me that is bearing witness to my pain, there may well be something else in my head or my heart that is also hurting. The pain in my back was real and it was located right there above my waist. But it would be valid to ask this question, is it possible that when you feel such pain that the cause might be something more than just what can be discovered in the realm of nerves and muscles? In other words, is it possible that when you feel emotionally or psychologically like you are carrying the weight of the world, whether that's actually true or not, that your back would hurt? In the midst of all the visits I made to the chiropractor, he suggested that I might benefit from massage. And to make it even more convenient, he told me that he had a guy in-house who could do massage. Did I want an appointment? Okay, I thought, what could it hurt? So I went for a massage, and of course the massage therapist asked me what was going on, and I told him about my back. And he worked some of my lower back muscles as I expected he would, but what surprised me is that as he moved up and down my body, as I was laying there face down on the massage table, the tightest places were actually just above and below the defined problem area. Do you know why? From what he told me and from what I could feel, it would seem that all the muscles in my shoulders and my mid-back and all the muscles at the top part of my butt were tired and tight because they were trying so hard to compensate and carry my lower back. They were trying to help out. 
so they were hurting too. So yes, it was my back where I was feeling my pain, but it was also the closest neighbors to my lower back that needed extra care. It was a very tangible reminder that there are no separate parts of the body. There are no isolated parts. There are no less important or more important parts. There's nothing to be gained in blaming or ignoring or resenting one part of the body or another. My back was me, and I needed to think about how to care for me, for the whole of me. And so the story goes, we don't think much about our weaknesses or vulnerabilities until one part of the body suffers. And then when that one part suffers in truth, all parts suffer because the parts of the body are all connected. All are parts of one body. I might think my stupid back when it seems as though my back is the cause of all my pain, but there's always more going on. Other parts are adjusting or compensating or even complaining alongside my hurting back. And when that happens, whether it's the back or any other part of the body, we would do well to care for the weaker and more vulnerable parts and not blame the parts of the body that suffer, but instead ask, what is going on in the whole body? What has changed to tip the balance? What kindness might we extend to the vulnerable, to the hurting parts of the body? What do we need to be paying attention to? The presenting issue, some deeper problem, or perhaps both? As we've been navigating the most recent chapter of the pandemic with this more transmissible and sneaky variant of the virus, I have again been thinking a lot about the body, about the physical, my physical body and its health and vulnerability. I've been thinking about your bodies and how they might or are affected by illness, but I've also been thinking about this body, the community. And as I think about the well-being of this body, the church community, I find that it involves a complex kind of thinking. It leads me to some uncertainty and even confusion. Because as carefully as I think about it, I keep discovering that I'm not sure how best to care for all the parts of this body. I'm not sure what is best for the whole body, much less each individual part. I don't know whether pain expressed is isolated or systemic. I'm not even sure what constitutes health for this body? Is it keeping people apart? Is it trying to find ways to keep them together? Is it primarily and in the most pressing way a matter of caring for the physical health and the physical vulnerability? Is it just as important to factor in mental health issues and needs, relationship needs? Concern about the negative effects of physical or social isolation? And what if it's all those things, but they pull in different directions? Is there such a thing as balance in the body right now? Is there even such a thing as whole health? These things are confusing and sometimes contradictory The one fact, however, that seems clear to me in all of this is that we are connected. We are a body. The scripture for this morning tells us that, but our own experience tells us that as well. The fact that we are connected means that no part goes its own way or makes its own choices without having an effect on the other parts. There is a dynamic of interaction and connection that is always at work. It is true in our own individual bodies. It is true in the body of this community. And if we are paying attention, even nature tells us of this. Richard Rohr gives the following example of interconnectedness from the natural world. 
The world of ecology is so exciting, he writes, because we are recognizing from all of the scientific disciplines that the entire nature of the biological and physical universe is absolutely relational. We're discovering that when we change one factor, everything changes. I was watching a show on birds recently, he writes, and I learned about red knots that migrate annually all the way from Tierra del Fuego to certain Arctic islands north of Hudson Bay. Thousands of miles. I said to myself, wouldn't they be happier if they did not do that every year? But no, this is their destiny, to fly north some 9,000 miles each season. They stop in the middle of the journey on particular beaches along the Delaware Bay. There they always ate the recently laid protein-rich eggs of horseshoe crabs. Those eggs would give them enough energy to get all the way to the Arctic. Well, we good Americans, he continues, decided that horseshoe crabs are sort of ugly and not very useful, but they do make excellent bait and attract eels and conch in great numbers. So we started using them for fish bait and killing these crabs indiscriminately. It took about 10 years to recognize that the beautiful red knot might soon be extinct. Researchers observed and studied and they found multiple possible answers such as climate change along with coastal development, but you'll probably guess one of the main reasons we were killing the shorebird's life source. As soon as horseshoe crabs were more protected against use as bait, we saw the return of the lovely little red knot. The birds again had available protein they could eat on the shores of New Jersey and make it all the way to the Arctic but it's going to take, apparently, several decades for them to be fully restored. Now, this example might seem like such a simple, unimportant thing, writes Rohr, and yet a spiritual seer, one we would call a mystic, would recognize that God did not create horseshoe crabs or red knots for no reason. They're part of an entire ecology or spiritual plan. I just offer this one little example of ecologically interconnected and interpenetrating world that we're all a part of, but we have to be curious to see it. He concludes, this is a differently shaped universe than many of us thought and leads to a very differently shaped spirituality. As Bill Plotkin says, spirituality becomes a sinking back into the source of everything. We're already there, but we haven't been trained to see ourselves there. This is, in fact, the new cosmology through which we have to be retrained to see the world. Suddenly we realize, of course, that God is not out there, but God is in all, through all, and with all. Now, what do you care about horseshoe crabs or migrating birds? Maybe not a lot but you care more broadly, I am sure, about the wondrous creation, about the mysteries that hold things together, about that which enhances and supports life, about how one body part helps another, and about the health and well-being of all creation. You care about all of this and you are aware of all of this, and yet even so, our temptation may be to seek our own advantage or convenience, to use up the resources around us, to blame those who are in pain for their pain. Our temptation may be to act as though backs are separate from shoulders and butts and even brains and hearts. Our temptation may be to try to act as though every part is not actually connected to every other part. Our temptation may be to try to go it alone. But here we are, like it or not, connected to the other parts of the body. Our arms and legs are connected to our torsos. Our ears and eyes are connected to our heads. Our lives, our ups and downs, our well-being, our joys and sorrows are connected to each other's lives and ups and downs and well-being and joys and sorrows, like it or not. 
There are times when in response to the phrase, like it or not, I would say not. Times when I resent the demands and expectations of those connections. The sense of responsibility we owe to each other. The constant call for awareness and compassion. But then I think of the other side of it. The fact that our connectedness means that we are not alone in the world. And that we are neither too important nor not important enough. And that because we are parts of one body, we have good support and accountability. And we have the gifts of both challenge and comfort as we make our way through life, as we live in this world together. We need each other. We have each other. We balance each other. We belong to each other. We are one body. Thanks be to God.